it's good to have Brad Cranston with us with Awake America. He'll be involved in our missions conference. Just couldn't wait to get here, so he got here ahead of time. So I'm going to put I'm going to put him on the spot. Can you come up and give us like a three minute preview? Are you able to do that? All right, all right. He's going to come up and just give you a, a quick preview of of what he does. It's good. Thank you. Hey Amen. Good to be with you, folks. Glad to have my wife Heidi with me, and uh, we're traveling together now. She just finished 30 years of homeschooling. So, uh, so she's enjoying getting away from home. She didn't know there was a rest of the world out here, but there is. And uh, so I'm glad to be with you. And we work with uh, California Capital Connection and Awake America, California Capital Connection up at Sacramento. Four primary goals of California Capital Connection. One is to have independent Baptist pastor presence at the state capitol in Sacramento and on a regular basis. We've done that now for five or six years up there at the capitol, connecting, building relationships, uh, with legislators. Number two, identifying the good and godly legislators. And yes, you do have good and godly legislators in the state of California, somewhere between seven and ten. Uh, some of those are born again believers, and uh, they are stand by. And you only have 120 legislators, so that's not that's not bad. <laughs> and uh, you laugh, but that's that's good. That's significant. And by the way, those seven, the way they're voting, they vote consistently against all, with one exception, they're voting against uh, all the junk that is being pushed by your California legislature. And they really need your prayers because they are in a fight uh, every day up there in Sacramento. So we try to identify those folks, encourage them, tell, try to get them to stay, and uh, hope, pray that, that God will send others to join them. Then thirdly, a gospel witness to anybody at the state capitol. And you have large uh, office staffs up there. So always looking for opportunities to witness uh, to legislators and to staff in the state capitol when the pastors are there. And then finally, tracking the legislation with a focus on religious liberty, watching for the bad legislation, which is quite a, uh, quite a job in the, in the state of California. And there's a lot of that, but there's some good bills that are proposed as well each year. And then connecting that information out to the pastors in the state and to folks uh, in the church. And you'll have the opportunity later this week at the missions conference to sign up to get our emails and we'll tell you who your state legislators are and let you know when they need to be contacted. So appreciate the opportunity to be with you folks, and uh, looking forward to the service tonight. Thank you, Pastor. That man is an optimist. Seven, <laughs> seven to ten good godly legislatures in a state of 42 million. <laughs> We're doing good. <laughs> anyway, so no, that sounds like a challenge, and he'll be presenting in more detail in our missions conference and in the breakout session, so looking forward to that. It's good to have him here with us tonight. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 33. Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. I want to preach tonight on the nature of the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the privilege that is ours to gather, to assemble together. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time as we look at your word, that you'd speak to our hearts, work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're continuing through the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ as we close out our uh, series on the kingdom. And I'm going to make a concerted effort to uh, make better progress. Uh, we'll see. Matthew 13, 33, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took, hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, this parable has caused uh, a lot of confusion with people because of the other references in the Bible uh, to leaven, references that are generally negative. Uh, Exodus 12, 14, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it for a feast. Keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whatsoever, whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So pretty severe consequences there. You shall observe, uh, verse 17, the feast of unleavened bread. For in this self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Verse 19, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations. Shall ye eat unleavened bread? 
Um, Exodus 13, 7, unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. There, thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. Uh, Exodus 34, 25, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Leviticus 2, 11, No meat offering which, shall, which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. Leviticus 6, 15, He shall take of it in his handful of the flour of the meat offering and of the oil thereof and all the frankincense which is upon the meat offering shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor, even the memorial of it unto the Lord. The remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with unleavened bread. Shall it be eaten in the holy place in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation they shall eat it. It shall not be bacon with leaven. And so you could easily get the idea that leaven is bad. That leaven is negative. But then Leviticus 23, 15, ye should count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of Two tenth deals, they shall be of fine flour, they shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And so for the Feast of Pentecost, it was specified that there would be leaven offered with that, uh, that they would uh, specifically use that. Primarily, however, leaven is used uh, to represent sin. Uh, it's used to represent false doctrine oftentimes in the Bible. Matthew 16, 5, when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. They reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. And which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand, that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And so we see it used to represent false doctrine, wrong doctrine. 1 Corinthians 5.1, it is commonly report, reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And as you know the story, the Corinthian church had not excommunicated, ex exercised church discipline on this man that was living in an open for perverted sexual sin. So Paul goes on to say, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so there again you have, you have the analogy made of, of, of someone living in sin and, and accommodating that and being referred to as leaven. Galatians 5.1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Uh, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? And then he goes on to say, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so, because most references to leaven in the Bible have some kind of negative association, some kind of uh, negative uh, connotation, uh, some have presupposed that this reference of our text tonight is, is negative. In Matthew 13, again, another parable, spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. So if you come with that assumption to this uh, parable, then your interpretation and your application will reflect that. Leaven or yeast is not in and of itself bad. In fact, uh, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread for those seven days, yeah, they were to have the leaven out of their houses, 
uh, and they were going to, supposed to go through and make sure there was no leaven, but the idea was the rest of the time they had leaven in their houses. They used leaven in their bread, but it signified, it signified uh, a lot of things. There were certain laws and commandments and instructions that were given to Israel about a lot of things to symbolize and signify the purity and the pure relationship God wanted them to have with Him. Uh, Deuteronomy 22.10, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. In and of itself, that's not sinful behavior. But God was giving them specific instructions. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 11, uh, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together. Uh, again, signifying just the purity. There's nothing sinful about that. If there is, most of you, most of us tonight are sinful, sinning right now in church. If you check the label, have your partner check the label, it might be a little difficult, but you probably have uh, diverse uh, garments or textures together in your garment. Um, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds. Uh, again, they were to remain pure, and those commands illustrated that, uh, that point. It was just a living object lesson. God gave them a lot of object lessons. They got a lot of memorials to continually remind them of things. Um, make a pillar of stones, an altar of stones, and when your son asks in time to come, what, what mean these stones? It's an opportunity for you to tell him. Put a ribbon of blue around the fringes of the, your garments that, that every time you see it, they would remember. And so there were a lot of things given that would signify that, and the unleavened bread was, was one of those. Uh, it's not sin if you do those things. You plow your garden with uh, two different kinds of animals, or you wear uh, linen and wool and together, or you uh, sow your vineyard and you, you plant different kinds of grapes or pl different kinds of seeds of, of uh, fruits, vegetables, whatever. That, that's not sinful. But all of that was il illustrating that God wanted to have a special covenant relationship with them and they were to remain pure. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he said, I wrote in, unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For them must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. And he would say, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And so again, uh, the idea was that there was to be some separation. He said, but not leave, if you have to stay away from those people in the world, you'd have to leave the world because they're all that. They're all sinning in that way. So, but you remain pure. If a brother, someone that calls themselves a Christian, is going to live this way, you separate from them. So there was still that same measure of separation, not in the same way that the Jews were to separate in their day in the Old Testament times. And so, uh, this parable does not make sense if we interpret it as supposing uh, that Jesus was using leaven to represent sin. If you look at it again, Matthew 13, 33, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And so is he saying the kingdom of heaven is going to be permeated through and through with sin? It's just going to be uh, soaking in sin? No, of course not. He's not saying that. Uh, the emphasis is not on the nature of the yeast or the leaven that could represent evil, but rather on the way that yeast works. Leaven works once it's introduced into the mixture, once it's put into the dough. Uh, when someone mixes yeast into the ingredients that will make bread, they, they start a process that in essence is irreversible. It's just going to kind of take over and uh, uh, it will continue to work pervasively and persistently and, and really unseen from the inside out, if you will until the entire mixture is made re ready for the oven, made ready to be uh, baked. Uh, the person that starts that has no way of interrupting or reversing the process once it has begun, once they've mixed that all in. And so Christ in this, in this figure was teaching that when uh, this new form of theocracy where God would rule the earth ultimately one day, uh, it would work persistently, pervasively. It would work uh, irreversibly. The, the sowing of the Word will produce uh, irresistible growth. Uh, all earthly kingdoms have been established uh, by some form of subversion, some form of military might and strength. Uh, they've been established by the display and the actions of external military force and power. 
Well, Christ was teaching this new theocracy will be established not by external force or power or discernible might, but rather uh, by a quiet working from within. Um, in John 18, 36, you remember Jesus stood before Pilate. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. You remember just prior to that, then Simon Peter, uh, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into thy sheath. And Peter, just put that away. I, I, I'd like to see Christ's countenance. I'm sure he probably didn't show it on his face, but it's just like Peter again, really, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's whacking a guy's ear off. Um, but he says, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He, he could have called 12 legions of angels. He could, have, he could have overthrown them very easily. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's not going to be established in the way that most uh, earthly kingdoms are established. And so, uh, anyway, I don't think we really sped up much on that parable. It's just one verse, but we made it through it, okay? Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And we spent time with this earlier before, so uh, both of these parables are really pretty straightforward. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is of inestimable value. It's worth more than anything. Don't let anything stand in the way of you becoming a Christian, uh, following the Lord. Uh, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. This kingdom is worth more than anything. Jesus would say, what has a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If it were possible for you to gain the whole world and everything in it and die lost, you've lost. You've lost. And you're not going to be able to gain the whole world. So you're not even going to get that if you die lost and die without Christ. And so the kingdom of heaven is, is worth more than anything. And as we would look forward to that, as we would seek to win souls so that they could one day be a part of that. I need to realize most important work that we could possibly ever do. All right, that was quicker, wasn't it? That was good. That was two. You just zipped by there. I know we spent time with it before, but Matthew 13, 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea, gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Remember one point that the disciples came and said, Hey, declare unto us the, the parable of the sower. They, they didn't quite understand it. He explains that to them. But he'd given, uh, he's given them eight parables in a row. He said, Have you understood these things? They say, Yea, Lord. And, and this is similar to the parable of the tares and the wheat. Uh, it was common in Jesus' day for fishermen to, uh, to use two boats and a, and a large net uh, between them that would catch everything in its path. And so they would throw this large net. If there was a smaller boat, just throw out a smaller net and try to gather it up. If you've ever been to Israel, they'll do that for you on the Sea of Galilee and act like they're going to catch a fish. And I used to get excited. And then finally one day I asked the guy, I said, do you ever catch anything? He said, no, we don't. But they throw it out there like they, they're going to. Um, but they would, they would use two boats and they would be going, making their way towards shore and a big net between and they would drag that. And uh, by the time they got to shore, they, they had caught everything in its path. And so uh, the net was indiscriminate in its gathering together uh, of, of everything. Once it's drug up on shore, uh, it would have caught some inedible fish. It would have caught some other creatures that uh, would then be cast away. Of course, the audience that Jesus spoke to would have been very familiar with that process. And so Jesus used uh, that analogy to illustrate that there was coming a reckoning for the ungodly. There's coming a day when the wicked would be separated from the just. There's coming a day when judgment would fall on those that have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The first four parables of chapter 13 were spoken to the multitudes 
And the last four parables were spoken to the disciples in the house. The others were outside. Uh, Matthew 13, the same day, went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him. So that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So Jesus is in this ship just at the very edge of the Sea of Galilee. The people are gathered on the shore. A huge multitude has, has come, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and he proceeds to tell all those parables that were very relatable for them, uh, dealt with the kind of occupations they had, the kind of life they lived. Uh, verse 34, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. So the first four parables are directed to the multitude. He went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Uh, they, want, they want that explained to them. And verse 53, it says, It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And so these verses kind of divide and frame the chapter for us. But before we leave this chapter, we see that there was one final parable, uh, parable number 8, uh, verse 51. Again, Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. He says, Have you understood? Yeah, we understood. Okay. Verse 52, Then said he unto them, Therefore... Every scribe which is instructed under the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Therefore, therefore, because they understood, they had received truth and they had appropriated it, and now they were to pass it on. The householder, the the master, the good man of the house, the steward, he had a responsibility He had an obligation not only to grasp and apply truth, but to pass it on to others. First parable of this series, uh, chapter 13, involves sowing seed to the lost. The different kinds of soil, the parable of the sower or the seed of the soil, whatever you want to call it. Uh, But those that respond favorably must then be instructed. They need to grow. They need to be discipled. Uh, There was an obligation then on the part of everyone who knew the truth of the Word of God to give it out, to be an influence on others. If you're saved tonight, God wants you to be an influence, a positive influence on others, saved and lost. Consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. All of the one another commands in the New Testament, that involves you, that involves everybody. That involves uh, every born again child of God. Sometimes we can get the mentality, I think, that, well, we have the pastor, we have the staff, and they're kind of paid professionals. They do that work for us. No, uh, we're all to do that. That's one reason I don't like the the term minister, uh, because we're all to be ministers. We're all to minister to one another. I don't like the term reverend. Psalm 111 says, holy and reverend is his name. Uh, So, I don't like those terms. Uh, Minister's okay, because, but we're all ministers. You're a minister. Well, I'd be nice to Dan Watson tonight. Minister Dan Watson. So, uh, picked on him Thursday night. So, we'll be nice tonight. So, uh, we're, we're ministers. We're to minister one to another. Well, all the one another verses, love one another, pray for one another, uh, exhort one another, bear you one another's burdens, and so on, all through. And so, that is a responsibility. And so, as you are growing, as you're learning, then use that for something. Put that into practice. The Bible says, knowledge puffeth up. If all we get is knowledge, we become good at playing Bible trivia games. But we're of no use to God. 
We have no service to others if all we're doing is just getting puffed up with knowledge because uh, we've studied the Bible or we've been to Bible college or whatever it might be. Nowhere to use that and nowhere to give it out. The Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, there were some new things in that they were newly revealed, if you will. Now, Paul would write to the church at Corinth, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things." Yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God, or by the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so that mystery, the mystery of the church age and the Jews and the Gentiles coming together and all of that, uh, Paul was speaking in essence in that day something new, something that had uh, been hidden from the prophets of old. Uh, he writes to the church uh, at Ephesus, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not known, made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And as we saw this morning in Romans uh, chapter 11, the fact that for a time the Gentiles were set aside, or the Jews were set aside. They, they had failed in their God-given mandate to be a light to the world. But the Jews and Gentiles would come together, fellow heirs, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. He writes to the church at Colossae, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when Christ taught the people... He was bringing things that were new to them, things that they hadn't heard and speaking in a way that they were not used to, they were not accustomed to. And Mark 1.22 says they were astonished at His doctrine. For He taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Matthew 13, when He was coming to His own country, He taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? And so it is incumbent upon those uh, that teach to have something to say. It's incumbent that when we've been saved a while that we would be able to pass on a truth to, to the lost, obviously, to be a witness, to be a testimony, but then to fellow believers, to instruct them, to encourage them, to help them. Uh, Paul speaks of those who are desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Uh, Jeremiah 2.8 said, The priest said not, Where is the Lord? They that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And so it's incumbent upon us that do have the truth, that do know the Lord, to speak up, to share, to be a blessing, to be an encouragement to others, uh, to exhort them and challenge them. Um, in Nehemiah's day it was recorded about the Levites. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense, caused them to understand the reading. If you've been saved a while, that's not just the pastor's responsibility. That's not just the adult Sunday school class teacher's responsibility. It's your responsibility as a child of God. You've been saved. Now, if you just got saved three weeks ago or three months ago or, or six months ago, that takes some time to grow and learn and all of that. But if you've been saved a while, you ought to be able to take this book and do something with it. 
You ought to be able to take this book and instruct others and, and encourage them and, and uh, challenge them to grow. And 1 Peter 4.10 is every man hath received the gift. And if you're saved, God's given you gifts to use, to use for him. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. Not pastor to people, not staff to people. Yes, that's my responsibility. I'm supposed to teach and preach the Word of God. But we're to minister, we're to use our gifts to minister one to another as good stewards. It's required in stewards that, men, that a man be found faithful. If you are saved tonight, you're a steward. We're required to minister one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, the mouthpiece of God, uh, the messenger of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so we have that responsibility. Uh, Paul would write to the church at Colossae, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry that thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Uh, do something. Be a blessing. Be a help. Uh, find some position that you can, that you can, that you can do. You say, well, I, I'm not a good teacher. You don't have to stand in front of a class and teach. There are other things you can do. You can encourage people. You can pray for them. You can, you can do other things to encourage them. You can take some uh, police officer flyers and find a police officer and give those to them. And by the way, they'll never turn you down. You know, if you're worried, oh, what are they going to say? They're always going to be happy. Even if they're faking it, they're going to act happy at least. Uh, but but they've, they've put up with so much nonsense in, uh, from the media and, and cities across this country. They're happy when someone comes up and says, hey, our church is having a special day. We want to honor you. We want you to come. Uh, they'll never turn that down. And so uh, that's the easiest visitation you can ever do. So uh, keep some in your car and drive fast on the way home so you can meet a police officer. <laughs> They'll come to you. <laughs> but, but as we grow, we're to do something with what we've learned. Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews writes in chapter 5, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be in front of a class, out of stage fright. I'm not, but but you, all of us teach other people by our lives, by our attitude, by our words. We teach other people. And if we're saved, we ought to be teaching them, encouraging them in a godly way. And uh, just even the young people in our church, the kids in our church, they're never going to come up to you and say, I'm watching you. But if you grew up in church, you know that there were people in your church that you watched. There were people in church that, you know, as you're five, six, seven years old, you think, man, that man, he's so friendly. He's so nice. That lady and, and Sunday school teachers and, and ones that just did a great job. And, and you watched them. And don't think that the kids of this church aren't watching you. Um, and it might even be just on Sunday nights after church when we're playing volleyball in the gym. They might be watching. And if you get upset at the referee's call, they might be watching. We have an impact in everything we do. Paul could write to the Philippians, those things which you have both heard and learned and seen in me do. Um, and you can follow my example. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so... We have an impact for good or for bad in, in how we live our lives. He says, for when for the time you, have, you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first oracles, principles of the oracles of God, and to become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Those who by reason of use. In the Greek, the word gymnazo, from where we get our word gymnasium. And if you played sports, you know, the one, of the, one of the keys to success on the basketball court or the football field or the tennis court or the baseball field or wherever is the repetition over and over and over. And by reason of use, you're perfecting uh, your skills. You see that shortstop in, in a blink of an eye that's, that's diving to his right and extending his glove and comes up and in one fluid motion he's throwing the guy out at first and you think, wow, and he can make it look so easy, but it wasn't easy. It was hard. 
He, it just became easier as it became automatic. But that was, a, that was thousands and thousands and thousands of times fielding a ball, hit to his right, hit to his left, diving for it, coming up, throwing. And by the time they've perfected that by reason of use, we watch and say, wow, that guy's really good. He's a natural. Now he had to work at it. Uh, and the guy that can pull up and shoot a three-pointer with somebody draped all over him and swish it through the net to win the game. And think, man, he made it look easy. But he worked at it. Over and over and over and over and over. Uh, the guy that in, in the clutch can, can hit those two free throws. Uh, he might stay after practice and shoot 100 free throws every practice. He might show up early and shoot 100 or 200 free throws before practice ever starts. By reason of use, he got better. And in your Christian life and my Christian life, by reason of use... Our senses are exercised, gymnazo. They're made better by over and over and over doing the right thing and practicing and praying and asking God for wisdom and asking Him to help us grow. And then we are to take and pass along that to others, to younger Christians. You know who usually coaches the basketball team? Somebody that played basketball before. They're passing it on. The person that coaches the baseball team? Somebody that played baseball before. If it's Little League, they may have just drug in a dad that didn't play because they couldn't find a coach. But generally, it's somebody that's played baseball before. That, that's, who's, that's who's teaching in uh, martial arts or, or tennis or whatever it might be. Someone that has already done it, already learned, and they're passing that on. Well, the Christian life is supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be helping uh, baby Christians. We're supposed to be teaching them, bringing them along, that they might grow, that they might uh, mature. We're to mature, and then we're to help others do the same. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What you've heard from me, you pass on to somebody else who's going to pass it on. That's the way the Christian life is supposed to work. Again, Hebrews 5.13, everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's, he's unskillful in all that. He, he hasn't learned all those things because he hasn't really worked on it. So Paul could write uh, to the Corinthians, Wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. He said, I, I've, I've sent Timothy to you now. So he's going to pick up where I left off. He's going to help you. He's going to uh, mentor you. He's going to model the Christian life for you. And you see as you go through uh, the New Testament, you go through the prison epistles and all that, Paul is talking about that whole idea about being an example, being an example of the believer, uh, being, being a pattern that others can follow as they see your life, as they see how you live. Again, Philippians 4, 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So we that are believers are not just to take in we're to give out. If all you ever do is take in, you're going to stagnate. Your Christian life is going to ultimately be boring. God intends you take out. You give out. Take in and give out. You're not to be a reservoir. You're to be a conduit and to keep on giving. And again, Israel, the Red Sea, or the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, two completely different Seas. The Dead Sea only takes in. It doesn't give out. The Sea of Galilee takes in and gives out. So it's, it's teeming with life and there's fish and all of that. In your Christian life, if you're not giving out, you are stagnating. You're stagnating. God intended that we give out. We take in, we give out. We're to continue. Yes, we're to continue to take in. And Paul, Peter would write as he closes out his second epistle, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Continue to grow. Continue to grow in knowledge. Grow in grace. Uh, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in that way. Uh, we are to take in. But if we're not giving out, then it's all for naught. Think about it. If you're saved and you're doing nothing with your Christianity, you're just simply taking in you're not being an encouragement to others. You're not being a challenge to others. You're not witnessing. You're not doing anything else. To what purpose is there you taking in? So when you get to heaven, God can say, man, you learned a lot. You knew a lot. No. We're, we're to do something with it. Every one of us. Every one of us. 
He said, well, I, I, I tithe so that people can... Get. No, 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 we're, we're to do things. We'll have a missions conference this week, and we'll have missionaries come in, and they'll represent their fields. And you might say, well, I give to missions, and that's good. We ought to do that. And they're going to other countries in our place in that sense because we can't all go into all the world by ourselves. There's too many countries. We couldn't learn the languages. And, and so in that sense, they go and they represent the gospel on our behalf, and we, we finance that and make it possible. But we don't give to missions so that they can go and we just sit and give. It's good to give. We ought to give. But they're not going to France or Israel or Mexico or the Philippines so that we don't have to do anything. It's just we can't go to Israel, France, the Philippines, Mexico, and all of that ourselves. But we can go to a coworker at work. We can go door knocking on Saturday morning. We can go to those in our neighborhood, and we, and we should. And then if you've been saved a long time, you can come alongside a younger Christian and just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray for this one. I want to encourage them. And, and I'm going to make them, not to be a nuisance, but I'm going I'm to just, if they miss, I'm going to call them and just say, I missed you. Pray for them and, 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 and be a blessing to them. If you don't do that, it happens gradually, but you're going to kind of calcify and dry up and, and wonder how come the Christian life isn't better than it is but it's because you're not living the Christian life. Because part of the Christian life, yes, you take in, grow in grace, grow in grace, grow in knowledge. But the other part of the equation is you've, you've got to be giving out. You've got to be giving out. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And so examine your life. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. So look into the mirror of God's Word. How much are you giving out? Oh, we gather and preach and teach and we take in, and that's good, that's necessary. I'm not minimizing that. But then as we go and we dismiss and we go out into the community, how much are we really giving out? How often do we give somebody a track? How often do we wake up in the morning and pray, God, would you give me opportunities today? Help me to seize the opportunities you give to be a witness. How often? How often do we think of another believer and say, I think I'm going to give him a call. I haven't seen him in a while. I think I'm going to bake cookies and just go by and just try to be a blessing. How often we do that? Do we do that? It's part of the Christian life. It's not all just learn, 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 grow intellectually. No, knowledge puffeth up. Charity. When we're concerned about others, we look beyond ourselves. Charity. That edifieth. That's how you're really going to grow. That's how the church grows. That's how we grow as individuals. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I pray we'd not just be hearers. I pray we'd be doers. I pray that you'd guide this invitation time now in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed.